The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire, here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas, tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. Nair is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air. No mai, hara mai, whakatau mai rā, ki te konei ipurangi nei, ko Nair. Welcome to Ne, a podcast about being Māori in this modern world. Tao huri huri. I'm Mediana Johnson, Nōtoto Ihu o Waka Māori, and I'm very excited to be hosting this week's episode all about story sovereignty. Oosh! Within the publishing world. Kia mau tonu mai. No, welcome back to Nair. Our Māori writers are killing it. You only need to see the list of those nominated for this year's Ockham New Zealand Book Awards to see this. A wahine Māori writer is in the shortlist of every category. And two out of the four top writers for the Top Fiction Prize are again wahine Māori. New Zealand Book Awards Trust spokesperson Paula Morris told The Guardian that perhaps we are seeing a coming of age of Māori writers in print. Is it the case or is it that our people are finally getting publishing opportunities that they so deserve? Or in some cases, as we're going to talk to our manuhiri about today, making it happen for themselves. Patricia Grace, one of this country's most decorated and published authors, no Ngāti Toa, Ngāti Raukawa and Te Atiawa, was one of those who broke the glass ceiling for Māori writers. Her first book, Waiariki, which was published in 1975, was the first short story collection by a Māori woman writer. But Fire Patricia didn't even know this was the case that she was the first that she'd broken the ceiling until after the fact, because she says there was just such a lack of visibility of Māori in publishing. She didn't know what Māori were publishing, what women were publishing, let alone wahine Māori. Now, almost five decades on, she says the internet and social media has meant that visibility of Māori in the literary landscape has gone from zero to 100. The internet means there are more opportunities than ever for Māori to publish online for the likes of Medium, Patreon, Substack, places where you can put your content and people can pay you a little bit of putia for the honour of reading them. Up great platforms for those who are looking to bypass publishing outlets, companies, and potentially pesky editors that want to constrain their speech. Uh, Substack is actually where one of my favourite personal essay writers and writing to a kana, Nadine Huda, is now publishing regularly. I think it's really exciting that there are these places that we can get money for for putting our voice out there. And I recently had the great pleasure of meeting another of my Māori literary heroes, Witi Ihamaida, completely by coincidence in a new town takeaway restaurant at lunchtime. And over the packed restaurant noise and trying really hard to hear through our muffled masks, I picked his brain on how to be a good Māori writer and how to be a good writer, how to make it in this world. And he said that actually these days there's so much more opportunity and freedom for Māori writers to create characters and narratives unconfined by stereotypes and expectations from the Pākehā publishing world about what a Māori story should be about. We can only sort of imagine what sort of response he would be getting back in the 70s from Pākehā publishers. So Witty says there's more freedom than ever for our people to tell our own stories. But I think that that's possibly because more of our people are forming their own publishing collectives and or choosing to publish their books off their own backs. This tenoranga tiratanga ensures that the publication process from start to finish is in the control of the writer. 
And when for so long in this country, other people have put words to who we are as a people, this is an incredibly powerful thing. Taking back control over our narratives from the inception of the idea to the finished Taonga in bookshelves means we can tell our stories our way. And potentially, as we're starting to see now, encourage more Māori writers and inspire others to do this, to say, I can write a book, I can produce this. And of course, the end goal being, as Fire Patricia says, to write what you want to write in the way you want to write it. So it's a very exciting time, particularly for a book nerd like me, and I can't actually keep up with all the incredible poetry, fiction, nonfiction being produced by our people. And that's a great problem to have. And it speaks to the incredibly exciting, burgeoning publishing world that our people are building for not only themselves, but for others. So next up, Ehoa Ma, I'll be talking with Kiani Matata Sipu, who has just self-published her first book. So stay tuned. Kia ora no. Kiani Matata Sipu of Te Wai Ohua ki Te Ahiwaru me Te Aakitai, Waikato, Ngāpui, Ngāti Pikiao and the Cook Islands is an award-winning photographer and writer. She recently won the New Zealand Woman of Influence Arts and Culture Award in recognition for her multimedia storytelling project Nuku, which profiles 100 Indigenous wahine from Aotearoa. These were recently compiled into a beautiful puka puka of the same name, released in December last year, which is the only self-published book shortlisted for a 2022 Occam NZ Book Award. I sat down with Kiani to talk to her about how she did it and why self-publishing. Obviously, Nuku started online. Did you always envision it becoming a puka puka? Was that the, always the end goal or did it just organically lead to that point? So a print publication was always part of the entire kaupapa. Um, The idea of a multimedia movement, I suppose, had to include print because that is my background. Um, My background, though, was in magazines, and I initially thought that maybe I was going to put out a magazine or a series of magazines. And it was our graphic designer who um, said to me, you know, why not make it a book? Um, And so, yeah, I took up that wedle straight away and we started moving towards that idea of a book immediately. Um, And so it was also really important to know that quite early on um, to ensure that we had all the content we needed for the Puka Puka when that time came. Yeah, okay, so it was there from the outset. Was self-publishing also the intent from the outset or is that something as you arrived closer to publication that you thought, hey, I'm going to do this myself? To be honest, I actually can't remember. (laughs) Um, And that's probably because a lot happened in those three years of creating Nuku that I can't quite remember whether or not I did toy with the idea of approaching a publisher. I am pretty confident, though, that it was always about self-publishing. It would have only been if I had an idea to go to to another publisher. I think anyone who knows me knows that I just go and do it myself because I'm pretty stubborn but also I have very strong opinions and don't necessarily welcome other opinions when it comes to the money that I'm doing (laughs) so it's always safer as well for me to to do things on my own like self-publish because then we reduce the conflict (laughs) any pending conflict (laughs) had you talked to friends Fano? Anyone who'd been down the publishing route, you know, gone through a mainstream publisher maybe or a formal publisher and what sense did you get from them if you did have those kōrero about potentially having daru <laughs> or disagreements with editors? I guess it wasn't so much. I, I mean, I should say that it wasn't so much about just having daru. It was really about ensuring that whatever happened with the nuku kaupapa stuck to the core values and the tikanga of nuku and story sovereignty being one of the core values, mana motuhake being one of the core values, um, led by, made by wahine core values. So unless there was a publishing team that had indigenous wahine, um, then really I wasn't going to be going anywhere else. Um, But I did have to get a better understanding of the book publishing industry. As I said, I came from print, I knew so much about magazine 
print and publishing and knew a lot about what it takes to put together a magazine, um, but didn't necessarily know the niche side of book publishing and you know, just where you would get things printed and what is the difference between self-publishing and then getting a commission from a publisher? What is that commission? What does that look like? How does that work? When does that get paid? And so it was more so just ensuring that I had as much information as possible to be really solid with the decision I was going to make. I think I already knew the decision I was going to make, but it was helpful to know what the alternative might have been. And so there are a couple of my friends who, none of whom had self-published, but a number of them who had gone through publishers who have had lots of success with their puka puka um, with publishers. And I got to talk to them about why they decided to do it that way and how it worked for them, what elements of it didn't work for them. And to really feel content in the decision that I was making, knowing what I was turning down in a sense. Do you feel like in a way, because Nuku has such an online following and especially in the lead up to the release, do you feel like that helped in terms of you didn't maybe need to, you didn't need a book deal to help with marketing costs? And then also in saying that, were there areas where you just didn't anticipate costs? Like all of a sudden, you know, did you find, wow, this is the cost of paper? I think, to be honest, I don't get shocked by a lot of things. Um, (laughs) My eyes are pretty wide open to what life costs and all the elements that come with the life that I decide to create for myself Um, and all the all the drama that comes with that when you're starting to make your own decisions and really live in that tinoranga tiratanga space but I think the thing that shocked me more was that I expected it to cost more true so I knew that it I mean let's be honest self-publishing is not cheap (laughs) It's a shitload of money. It's really hard. There's a whole lot of mahi that goes into it. But I was surprised that it it cost less than I expected it to cost. And I was prepared for it to cost more. Yeah, so you'd actually over-budgeted. Oh, no, I didn't budget at all. Don't talk to me about budgeting. Don't anyone, <laughs> anyone, anyone who knows me knows that I still don't even know my times tables. So don't talk to me about budgeting whatsoever. What I do know is how much money something costs and then how much mahi I have to do to get that money to make that thing happen. That's how I operate. That's not a good business model to follow, Fano. So, <laughs> so don't follow that. In terms of the the first part of your part I around the online audience, organically growing the Nuku Fano over those three years was hugely helpful in the success of the Puka Puka because we had a Fano who were already interested in the Wahine, who already had heard some of their stories, who were coming to our live events and who wanted more. And I guess one of the things about self-publishing is that you get to choose right down to the paper stock, how many ribbons you want to have, what you want to have on that cover, how you want that to feel. And that was really important to me because I dedicated so much of my life and time away from my whanau to this puka puka, but also I had the duty and the responsibility of ensuring that the wahine stories within this puka puka were honoured and were given, you know, additional mana in the way that it looked and felt. And so it was really beautiful to have that final decision over every single element and to be able to make that puka puka exactly how I wanted without having to compromise. You must be incredibly proud. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Obviously, a lot of aroha and thought gone into every element like you say the paper how it feels I mean so much thought and aroha has gone into that puka puka right down to uh, deciding on the three ribbons and what the colors of those ribbons represent and why there's three of them and what those three represent Um, there's pango there's ma there's kakariki so that's our honongatu uh 
te kore te po, te ao mārama, tu papa tu anuku. Um, there's toru because toru being, you know, a, a, an atua number, a, a number that we can associate with higher beings. And so ensuring that level of wairua tanga and protection over our puka puka, uh, when you open up that inside cover, there's a pātikitiki pattern that is designed by one of our nuku wahine, Kaila Campbell Kamariera, and that pātikitiki pattern represents uh, one of my favourite pūrāko that my nan uh, used to share with me about her getting flounder from our awa oruarangi. And so that's a way of representing my nan within the puka puka, but it's also at the beginning and at the end of the book. And so my nan keeps all those stories within them safe. And the cover itself is a very tactile cover. It's embossed and it's spot glossed and it's, you know, um, matte covering and all, all this kind of stuff because all of those things really matter that our tamariki at a very young age can run their fingers over the cover of that puka puka and they can feel the meaning behind the kupunuku and whether or not they can uh, read the words they can feel the words. And then, of course, the paper on the inside um, being my indigenous paper, <laughs> that I wanted yeah. something that really felt like it came from Papa Tuanuku and one of its more or most rawest forms. You know, the first book that I received, which is very exciting, by the way, when you receive the first book back from the printer, um, the first book I received, I've gifted to my kōtiro and... To be proud enough to give that to your tamariki, that's a really big deal. And so that's why I love the fact that I can say to her, we made this. You know, we made it. We didn't compromise on it. This represents story sovereignty, mana motuhake, wahine, decision making. Look at all these wahine voices. And it really does, you know, kia u ki te kaupapa o te mana wahine, it really does represent that kaupapa of mahine, mohine, kia hine, right down to the final step. But it's not an easy journey. Self-publishing is not an easy journey. It is hard and there's a lot of hustle and there's, so much mahi that goes into it. It's one of those things where you may not see a reward. There's highly likely going to be no financial reward. And so you have to be content in the reward of the impact of it or the kaupapa of it. But ultimately, look at what you've created. I mean, I love hearing about all these different layers. I would not have picked up on that. Well, um, I could talk about this with you all day. Um, I can't stop smiling. It's such an incredible book and what a taonga for for not just wahini Māori, but also love that it is wahini Māori driven and content with you at the helm, at the head of this waka, driving this kaupapa to its completion. Um, but just for, um, for Tao Māori, for Ngai Māori, to have something of this calibre to put in our bookshelves Tēnei te mihi nunui ki koe, e hoa, really appreciate your time and can't wait for your second book. <laughs> <laughs> Talo for Lover, I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora no e hoa ma. I'm joined now by my co-host, the indomitable Leonie Hayden. Kia ora. And the unassailable Te Kuru o Te Marama Jews. Te <laughs> <laughs> Tēnā kōrua aku mete. <laughs> tēnā, tēnā koe e hoa. Tēnā kōrua. I thought I'd give you some flash words to describe you today since, you know, considering the kaupapa of our, uh, of our podcast about the written word, Aye. or more broadly, story sovereignty. Aye, tēnā ranga tēnā tanga. We, we love it. And on that, I'm very, very, very excited to introduce our special Manu Hedi on the panel today, one of my best mates, an incredibly talented photographer, writer, poet, who is set to blow the literary world 
away with their work set to be released at Matariki. I'm a little biased though because I have the absolute privilege and honour of co-editing this taonga. No mai ki te pai o ne Trinity Thompson Brown nor Ngati Kahununu. Kia ora kari. <laughs> uh, tēnā tātou e kia ora Miriana. Uh, just so privileged to uh, be able to be here with you all uh, talking about this very important kaupapa of story sovereignty, um, especially given uh, I Am Navigator, uh, my debut poetry collection, uh, going through the self-publishing route and so exploring the wider landscape of story sovereignty within which this um, body of work will be um, collected into. Kia ora. Hi. And it wasn't something you immediately, you didn't come into writing these poems right thinking I'm going to self-publish. I know we've had many a wānanga and tell us, I guess share with everyone else a bit about how you landed on you, how important it was for you to have control over your work from start to finish. Mm. I think for me, I've always appreciated having a bit of distrust of institutions, especially given my degree, <laughs> which was in linguistics and te reo. And one of the best things about linguistics that I ever learned was this course that specifically um, conducted research under the assumption of power imbalances and power abuses um, and language as a way of, I guess, maintaining the control of that. And so I always just loved, um, had a bit of agitation towards whether it's media, whether it's publishing, whether it's these different institutions as sites of power that control and maintain it through different kaupapa and through different corridor. And so with I Am Navigator, originally, no, I didn't set out being like, I'm going to self-publish. The goal of writing essentially when I first started out was simply to make sense of the world because I just didn't understand the world around me as an autistic person, as a neurodivergent person, as someone who had gone through the church and experienced like the severe mental damage and harm of having like a cavity created in your mind to believe that you're less than, um, especially as a queer person and Pakatapui and trying to be straight for 10 years. Like there were just so many intersections that lined up that meant that when I left the church, I was extremely disenfranchised from spirituality, my own spirituality. But what's more, I was also very confused about what was true, what was truth, what was my truth, what was objective truth that resonated with me and what was the truth I held in myself. And then I went to the UN uh, after leaving the church and coming out as Pakatapui, uh, and that was an extreme, another extreme disenfranchisement because you the UN is seen as this institution of power that is able to create change for the better of people and yet you go in and you just see that it's another tool of colonial violence and oppression that allows you a seat at the table but you've got you've got masking tape over your mouth you know especially as indigenous people and it, and yet it's also the dichotomy of you're at the table and so you're not on the menu but you don't get to order and, and you don't have any money to control like the, how things go. And so you just get what you're given and just all of that. And so then coming back from there, I was just like, oh, fuck. Hicka, I just, <laughs> Hicka, I just need to write. I need to make sense of this world. And that's it. All of that's at um, 21, 22. And so writing really was just an outlet for making sense out of my own confusion. That's the origin of all of it. I always write to make sense of my own confusion and my own inner experiences when the world around me doesn't make sense. Because at least if I'm clear on myself, then I can actually figure out, I can figure out things outside of me once I'm right within me. It's that whole Lauren Hill quote, how are you going to win if you ain't right within? And facts, facts, facts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so... Yeah, writing started out as a means of making sense out of my own confusion. But as it progressed, I started developing, yeah, I started developing my voice. I started believing in my voice. Um, and I'd had other experiences of writing that had like precluded and created that sense of confidence, which I think is important and rarer as well. Like it takes time to build confidence in your own voice, especially as an Indigenous body where we're taught to doubt ourselves and to not believe our own truth. Right. Uh. And, and, and like even like the a prime example being like the Topunga Suppression Act and like our own spirituality as like a core fundamental part of Indigenous humanity being stripped away. 
So anyway, um, I Am Navigator ended up being a self-publishing co-papa because of the fact that it's an intergenerational collaboration with um, other people and the profit margin, all of the profits that go through I Am Navigator uh, are going to be set aside for this co that I really care about and I can't quite speak to it right now. <laughs> and that's just completely at odds with the prerogative of publishers. They, they're there for the profit. They're there to sustain themselves. And for me, I'm like, I'll take on that extra work because I want to see a circular model where I can create a taonga that's beautiful and sets a new standard for what publishing can look like, publishing your own work can look like, but then also create accessibility in another area that I also care about with the profits and where's the representation of authors having sovereignty over their own profit margins to be able to contribute to other aspects of te ao Māori that they care about when a, when a publisher kind of creates like this like self-sufficiency circle and what about creating like a cyclical economy just by way of your own works anyway Long-winded, but hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Goodbye. I love it. I love this about your brain, eh? Like everything is all connected and it's so well thought out. And actually I'm going to kind of contradict myself a little bit here, but open the path, you know, open this core doodle was saying, you know, you didn't always go down the self-publishing route, but that's not necessarily true, right? Because the first place that your poems appeared, right, was Instagram. And a lot of you listening will probably know Trin from the Instagram and all of their beautiful photography and poems and, so I guess did that did you consider at the time because that was really where you start, first started putting your work out there right did you consider that as a form of story sovereignty or were you just like people need to hear and see this I want to be seen I want these vocado to be heard by others in my position mm, I think I didn't conceptualize social media as a form of publishing initially um, I saw it as a way to connect with people but that conceptualization independent of being publishing. I guess that kind of, that definitely came about later because, you know, through presenting your work online and on social media, you're able to like create an audience. And usually like these audiences are connected and consuming the works of other Māori poets and authors as well and writers and toy Māori artists as well. So it becomes this like marae atea essentially Mm -hmm. online. But yeah, no, I didn't conceptualise it as publishing initially but fully understand that to be a form of sovereign publishing now. So what is a a physical puka puka? What does that mean to you to have that? To answer that question, I did this co-papa a while back. Uh, It was funded by Creative NZ. Uh, It was called Fruit from the Vine. And essentially it was like an online magazine. And the co-papa was about reducing the suicide statistics among rangatahi Māori by way of seeing more positive representation of Māori tanga of their own generation in the media. So that was the initial um, thing that it set out to be. But I, I had launched that right before going to the UN and then went to the UN and came back and was just burnt out across the board and couldn't continue it. But ultimately it still fulfilled its goal of being this like online pātaka kōrero. But I learnt from fruit from the vine, that I needed something with a fixed end date. I couldn't do open-ended. It needed to be start and finished in my mind. And so that turned my brain towards mediums that were fixed and were permanent. Um, And a book being like that, you know, a book, a short film, um, uh, exhibition, these are things that are fixed and by extension, like permanent in their set form. You can add to them, you can change them, you can re-edit them, but just recognising that my brain suits a fixed format because I get bored and I want to move on to the next thing. Yeah, I will. I think we can all probably uh, empathise with that, eh, being (laughs) journalists with short attention spans. Yeah, (laughs) love a deadline. Yeah, love a deadline. Yeah, we need those. Interested to hear what some of the challenges or some of the main challenges have been in your journey and self-publishing. Hi. Where do you even start? Mm. Um, start with money. <laughs> um, for me, I want to, uh, for I Am Navigator specifically for this first edition, and they're going to be three rounds at each Matariki for the next three years like this, where the first edition is 100 copies, 
but within each copy is three volumes. So it's 300 books total, but 100 volumes. It's their box set. It's a box set, collector's box set. Um, it's gold embossed. It's black buckram, Ooh. sewn binding, harakeke paper as the first Ooh. and last pages to like protect and hold the corridor. Like there's no expense spared. And that costs money. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a decent bit. Yeah, harakeke paper, right? How much, like, you were telling me the other day, like, yeah. that is not cheap. No, the harakeke paper alone is 7.5K. Wow. Um, yeah. But the thing is, and so I think it really starts getting my mind turning because it instantly, you know, like, listening to and digesting the corridor of, like, hidden figures, girls that invest, getting the um, barefoot investor. Um, I think... I don't know, irrespective of my, I guess, feelings towards capitalism and late stage capitalism, the reality is we still exist in it. And I want to be able to create sovereign taonga that are good for my uri, my like great grandchildren to be able to consume as if it were new. And so I'm like, well, that costs money and that's the currency at play. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, but yeah, it's definitely getting me thinking of like, okay, I need to start becoming financially autonomous and sovereign so that come my second book, which I've already started writing, I spend three years writing a book and then one year doing the logistics, um, and the designing and the proofing and all of that. Um, so come my second book, when it's time to release it, I want to be sovereign enough where I can just pay for all of these things upfront, no matter the cost. And the reality is I can't do that with this one, but definitely, I think that's a big part. If you are self-publishing and you have money, it's easy. It's just because then it's just about making decisions of how you want something and then paying for it. But if you don't have money, then it's about hustling. It's about working hard. It's about fine. It's about thinking smart, not hard or both actually in some cases to make it happen. Because especially in Te Ao Māori, there's just so many opportunities to do something new and do something that hasn't been done. But then at the same time, do things in a way that's informed by ancestral matauranga and ancestral memory. Like for me, all of the main aspects, I can confirm all of the main aspects if not all of the aspects in total of I Am Navigator are intergenerational. The photography is intergenerational. The editing is intergenerational. The design and the publishing, intergenerational. So every single aspect for me incorporates intergenerationality. And for me, I don't see how I can create a taonga that feels fitting without doing it intergenerationally because that feels like what my tipuna would do. And mm. I think as well, existing as someone from Ngāti Kahununu who's never lived there and existing in this diasporic kind of way of being like, I'm of the diaspora in my own country and in my own lands because I, I don't live on my ancestral lands. I never grew up there. My dad went through state care and so that disconnection was like quite a violent fragmentation and it's still never been properly reconciled. I look for ways to connect to my tipuna and how they would have acted and how they would have behaved as a way to feel some sense of like iwi tanga. Mm. And so that's one way to do it. Oh, hi. It's beautiful. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's stunning. I mean, you're not only trying to uh, help others to heal through your work itself, but actually the process of creating this book, you're trying to create healing. It's, it's really incredible. Mm. And I think we need, we need more models of how to... Yep. Um, not only right informed by te kanga, mm. te reo, the ways of our ancestors, but actually produce whether that's a film, yep. whether that's a puka puka, eh? and that's what mm. we're really getting mm. at here is mm. how yep. can we achieve story sovereignty? Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think as well because I didn't even <laughs> I haven't actually touched on what I am navigator about, so I'll just briefly talk to that. Um, I am navigator is three years of poetry written from Matariki 2018 to Matariki 2021. So it follows the Maramataka. And in the first editing, Wānanga, with um, uh, my then two editors, Miriana and also um, Kahukutia, uh, through that Wānanga, we were able to establish like a structure that the poetry fell within, which is the journey from Hawaii to Aotearoa. So volume one is Hawaii, volume two is Te Moana Nui Akiwa, and volume three is Aotearoa. And Basically, it's me writing about everything under the sun, from love, from heartbreak, from narcissism, from figuring out who <laughs> you are, from figuring out what the world is, from 
um, navigating sexual trauma, from reconciling what it's like when you feel lost and separated from your own body. How do you come back home? Moko is a form of healing because during the process of writing, I also received my peha from Sean Montgomery Newts and Vianney Parata. And so peha is a way of returning to my body when I've never known safety in it. It's talking about all these things. And the whole point of it is to create an emotional template of how you can understand your own emotions from an Indigenous Tao Māori perspective. And yeah, really excited for it. But then also the whole origins of it come from, I'm confused. I need to make sense of this. And so that's where all of it comes from. But it serves as like a roadmap of, hey, this is how I navigated my emotionality and my humanity from ages 21 to 25. And maybe it can help someone else when they're going through that age or maybe they're a different age. But yeah. What did that editing process look like? Did you like edit really hard? Did you, I mean, how many poems, for instance, yeah. did you start with and <laughs> how many will end up in the volumes? Oh, this is a great question. Do you want me to answer this one? <laughs> yeah, go for it, mate. <laughs> go the for traumatized it. editor. <laughs> well, Trin uh, <laughs> bought 400 poems. Holy. Plus to our first Wananga. Yeah. 444. And 44. Yeah. True, true. Sorry. It was more than 400. And I hadn't actually considered whether I should have uh, said to you beforehand, hey, can you do a bit of an edit first? <laughs> and <laughs> so <laughs> that was obviously the, well, we, what I loved is you uh, spoke to all of the poems, you um, went through them, and that was really important for your process, right? Was to, to be seen, to be heard, mm. and to, yeah, yeah, to, to have those poems, to have us really hear where you're coming from. And so that was quite important. And also through that, right, we um, decided that you needed to publish a book of those 400 for yourself, mm. which is, um, I think, the ultimate. It was yep. actually Kahu who came up with this, and I just, mm. I mean, that's the ultimate in story sovereignty, right? It's like, well, who says mm. that, you know, mm. your work needs to go out to the masses like those 400 poems are published now for you and then you yep. can choose now which poems you want to go out into the world so mm. that was quite an interesting part of the mm. process a eh? was actually naturally being very personal you yep. were a little resistant <laughs> can I yeah, say that fully. a little resistant yeah, to cutting some oh, of them. I was. and I was like cut, I was cut, cut. yeah <laughs> yeah um I think that was the thing yeah so Originally, and I think a really important, oh, to go back to your question, Leone, it looked like two editing wānanga over um, three, I think the first one was two or three days, and the second wānanga was three days. Um, and then from the second wānanga, we've just been doing back and forth edits remotely, and it's round one of remote editing, and then round two is sign off of like, yep, we're happy with it, yep, we're happy with it, yep, we're happy with it, and then it goes through designing. So that was that's the editing process looks like. But it's interesting because in the first editing wānanga, um, some of the takeaways for me was the importance of being witnessed as an author when you've really literally just laid out your soul to create a body of work that you want to help other people but also as a way of healing yourself, like poetry as a, as a form of therapy or writing as a form of therapy for yourself. And then the other really interesting thing that came from that first one was how we don't talk about what happens when the works that you create need to look different for yourself than what they do for the audience you're giving them mm. to. And why is it that the works that we create as sovereign artists and writers and creatives in our own right, why does what we need our works to be have to come secondary to what our audience needs? Why can't we do both? So that mm. was the cool thing about publishing literally just one copy of all of the poems I'd ever written from that three-year period as a way of honouring my own journey. And then it made cutting them so much easier because I'd done and seen through to completion what I needed my works to be for me. Yeah. And then from there, it was like, okay, I fed myself. Now it's time to feed my community. And what does that look like? And then from there, the co-designing process, I would say 
I'd say I became a lot less resistant when you were reading Mediana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, nut that doesn't fit. Nut that doesn't fit. This is the structure. Navigating. Journey. Yeah. What doesn't fit. And some of them were still good and just like, hey, yeah. we could do these enzymes. Mm. But it was ultimately what fits for this body of work. Editing is a brutal process. Mm. You've got to have people you can trust, right? Yeah. So there was Mediana and Kahu in the first instance, and then in the second one, Nanga brought on um, this amazing Rangatahi Māori, uh, emerging Māori poet, Nadia Heneau Rangi Solomon, and she was 19 at the time, so she was able to bring in the intersections of Rangatahi and neurodivergent, just to make sure that, because for me, this book is also me publishing for my 16-year-old self, um, to say, like, you made it, you kept on living when you didn't think you would, and, like, mihi to you for getting us here. And so having her perspective was really good to make sure that I wasn't getting so caught up in where I where I am that I forgot what I needed at my different ages. Well, it was just important as well, right, that Kahu and I could not speak to that perspective. And I wonder yeah. if that's something that mainstream publishers even consider, as if they mm. are the right editor for the particular... Yeah book yep. um, mm. or work that they are, they are looking at. Mm. Mm. Has anyone mm. else published? Mediana, Tikaru, have you guys published, cool. been published? Only on IG. <laughs> yeah, mm. The IG <laughs> publisher. Because I feel like there's yeah. probably advice um, to be taken from this kōrero for those, not only those who also want to self-publish, but maybe those who are interested in publishing the traditional route, but um, mm. still want to maintain their sovereignty in that relationship and as you say Mediana you might mm-hmm. not always get paired with a an editor that understands you or your co-pop or your the context for you and your work mm. um so what do you what would you say Trinity is sort of like the most important advice that you can give or that you have received in terms of sort of like holding your your mana in your space for what you need from the process mm. I think because uh, I've Obvious, like I've been working on the piece of story sovereignty for this week too. And across the board, what everyone that I've talked to said that's published um, is that good editors are gold. Don't let them go. If you get a good editor, like hold on to them. And yes, the editing process is going to feel hard regardless, but good editors are gold. And so, yeah. You nailed that, eh? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, fully. And no, I, think I was that's fucking also... like, as when Trent asked, I was like, oh, yeah. well, I've never edited anything. Why are you asking me to do this? Like, I can't yeah. do this. <laughs> but that actually touches on the next point as well of like sometimes, and Kiane, when I talked with her, also touched on this, was sometimes only you know what you know. And for me, what that looked like is looking at my friends around me and being like, you would be a good editor. You would be a good editor you would be a good editor. And did I have anything to back that up? No, but I had a feeling and I knew it would be true. And it did. So I think as well, that's another aspect of sovereignty within self-publishing that I really appreciated, that I could give my friends an opportunity to witness themselves being epic in a new way than what they had been. And I think there's a huge amount of power of that in terms of like boosting confidence and being like, yeah, man, I got this. I've edited a whole three volume collection. Like, man, that matters. Yeah. Mean and I mean, if you're not bringing the people that you care about in your community yep. up with you, then yes. what are you doing? Eh, that's what it yes. means to be Māori. Yep. That's what we all strive to do. Tēnā mihi nu nui kia koe e kari. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to about this process. Yeah. Um, and just can't wait for all of you to read. I am navigator. He taonga, he taonga, he taonga. Uh, it's going to make a lot of people feel very seen. And it's going to be wicked. So keep an eye out on bookstores in uh, Matariki. Um, a big mihi as always to our kaifakahaere kōnai Ipurangi, Te Ahi Butler. Thanks for making us sound flash and all good. Um, to NZ on Air for the putia to make this happen, as we've just been talking about. In this capitalist economy, you can't do much without money. So <laughs> cheer, NZ on Air. <laughs> uh, you can listen to all of our episodes on apple spotify or wherever else you get your podcast and check out the spin-off for trends feature article about this exact kaupapa story sovereignty particularly in the publishing world and for all of you aspiring writers or even artists graphic designers these ample opportunities now to put your work online just give it a go go for it your work deserves to be seen and people want to receive your beautiful mahi so with that enjoy the rest of your week e hoa ma. 
and catch you next time. Kakite. Kakite. NAIR is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air and brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network. It was hosted and researched by Leonie Hayden with Te Kuru Jews and Mediana Johnson. NAIR was produced by Te Aihe Butler with senior production from Jane Yee and project management from Mark Kelleher. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.